for a second, Jad. Uh, I want to just take a moment to try to figure out what exactly is happening to Anne. Yeah, why can't she stop? Yeah. It turns out there may be an explanation if you look into her brain. Remember earlier we talked about a little chemical called dopamine yep. and how she didn't have enough dopamine in her brain, so that was giving her some kind of movement trouble, the Parkinson's. Right. It also turns out to be the case that any time you do something that makes you feel good, your brain spurts out dopamine. For years, that's how scientists saw dopamine, as, as the neurotransmitter of pleasure, the neurotransmitter of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But you said earlier that dopamine has to do with movement. Well, what is the ultimate purpose of movement from the perspective of evolution? It's to get you to food. It's to get you to sex. It's to get you to a reward. Huh. So that's why the same circuits, the same chemical that controls motivation, that controls what you want, also controls movement. But uh, that, uh, that turned out it was a little more complicated than that. In the, in the mid-1970s, a guy named Wolfram Schultz decided to take a, a much closer look. And his subject was... A monkey. So he would put these very thin needles that can record the activity of individual dopamine neurons in the monkey brain. And they'd put the monkey in a room, and then every day they would walk down the hall to the room where the monkey was. They'd open the door. Hello, monkey. They'd flip on the light. They'd give the monkey some juice. Here you go, monkey. And then when the monkey sipped the juice... <laughs> dopamine. Happy monkey. Right. And then comes a surprise. He soon discovered something very odd about these neurons. As they juiced this monkey day. Hello, monkey. After day. Hello, monkey. After day. Hello, monkey. After day. Hello, monkey. The squirt of dopamine, which they were always measuring in the monkey's brain, seemed to move forward in time. What do you mean? Well, at first, the dopamine hit when the monkey took the sip of juice. Hello, monkey. <laughs> But after a while, the monkey got the dopamine hit when they entered the room and switched on the light. Hello, monkey. And then after a few more times, the dopamine hit when the researcher's feet could be heard walking down the hall. You see what's happening here? Hello, monkey. Um, not really? <laughs> You're going to have to bring it home for well, me. Well, I'll, I'll do it again then. What the monkey is trying to do is piece together the sequence of events that inevitably lead to juice. Exactly. That's what these cells do. They try to predict rewards. Oh. So this isn't just about movement or about feeling good. It's about finding the pattern of the thing that makes you feel good. Yeah. It's pattern finding. Oh, this is pure pattern recognition. This is essentially how your brain makes sense of reality. In some very primitive sense, it parses reality in terms of rewards. So this is how you get more food in the wild, is, is, you, is you can see the reward before anyone else can. So we're talking about like basic survival stuff here. Mm -hmm. There's one other wrinkle, though, about the dopamine system that makes casinos and slot machines so tantalizing, which is that these cells are also programmed to be very sensitive to surprising rewards. So this seems to be, most scientists speculate that this seems to be your brain's way of telling you, pay attention, you just got something for free. This must be good. Sit here in this nice comfy velvet chair and try to figure out this reward. So now imagine Anne sitting there at the slot machine. She pushes the button on the machine, the slot machine, and oh my god. And sirens and bells go off, coins clang. And inside her head, her dopamine neurons, they're saying, <laughs> this is wonderful. But now how did this happen? Where did this big reward come from? What did you do this time? Why are you so happy all of a sudden? And it starts searching for something. They had frogs and princes. Was and it the number of cherries, cherries that she had just before? Was it that this machine had 13 hits and this was the 14th? I thought I could tell. It has all kinds of pattern-like things. It has bells. It has lights. But the problem is... Is that there is no pattern to find. There is no pattern. It's inherently random. It's inherently unpredictable. And while the rest of us might just, you know, give up and walk away. God, I just wasted a hundred bucks on this stupid machine. I should go get lunch. Anne can't go to lunch. Her dopamine system is too powerful, too potent. Oh, because of that drug she's taking. Right. It keeps surging and surging, forcing her neurons to fight, fight hard to find a pattern. That's what's gripping her. Her brain is intoxicated at the possibility that it will learn how to to succeed, that it will crack an uncrackable code. I thought I was good at stopping the machines, in fact. She I told me a story about she would go to buy milk um, and, and then spend the next 12 hours with the milk rotting next to her as she puts quarter after quarter after quarter into this machine. 
Were you surprised when you learned that the medication might be responsible for your gambling addiction? I mean, someone had said to me, this medicine will cause compulsive gambling. I would have thought they were crazy. It's just at that time where the first studies come out showing that this is actually a common side effect of Recrip. Really? So there were other ands appearing in other places? Same deal? Absolutely. Basically, after my neurologist took me off the Requip... Her compulsion disappeared instantaneously. Almost immediately. That fast? Well, within a week, I'd say. Wow. It was gone. I haven't gambled for nearly three years. Did her uh, Parkinson's return? Yeah. I have tremors a lot worse. I've recently gotten a cane. I have trouble walking. I use a walker. So the price of not being a gambling addict is living with debilitating Parkinsonian symptoms. But my son, let me finish about my son. When I told him after I quit gambling, I said, son, I sold things that belong to you that you should have. And he said, mom, those are just things. It's just really great to have you back. Radio Lab will continue in a moment. Message two. This is Anne Klein Cyber. Support for NPR comes from NPR station Anne. The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, helping NPR advance journalistic excellence in the digital age. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. And the Annie E. Casey Foundation, promoting lifelong family connections for children and youth in foster care. On the web at aecf.org. This is NPR, National Public Radio. 